everybody, Ziv Simon here. I'm the creator of Surgical Master, and today I'm on the line with Dr. Itzhak Binderman from Israel. Hi, Dr. Binderman. How are you? Fine. I'm fine. And to see your smile, it's a, it's a good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It is for me, and a happy and healthy new year to you and everybody else. I must tell you that I listen very much to your webs. Yes. Surgical master. <laughs> they are very, very educative. I mean, educating people. And uh, more and more we need it. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. And Dr. Binderman, you were my professor 25 years ago, back in Tel Aviv University. I don't know if you remember me. It's a right claim. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's been a long time. And you've been, uh, you're uh, at the Department of Oral Biology at Tel Aviv University. Uh, you've been involved with dental implants, with implantology, with bone research for well over 40 years. Uh, it's right. almost as long as I'm alive. <laughs> so uh, you, you, in my opinion, are the best person to ask about many of the burning questions that we uh, in the dental field have and a lot of doctors that I work with in the surgical master community and in the world are very curious and have some challenges when it comes to preserving bone for an implant site. And I wanted to ask you uh, some very definitive questions about these issues. So uh, can we get started? Sure. Okay, wonderful. So, um, as a clinical observation, uh, all of us see that once a tooth is extracted in any part of uh, in the oral cavity, we are seeing bone resorption. So, the first question is, why do we see bone resorption? And a segue to that is, why do we typically see resorption of the buccal plate and not the lingual or palatal plate? Well, that's a burning question today because what we see is, of course, that uh, after a while, after extraction, we see that uh, we lose usually the buccal plate, and this is also a problem, an aesthetic problem, not only a functional problem. And this is because, and I, I was thinking about this question for, for, for a few years, and especially the, uh, now because uh, it's, a, it's a problem really to restore the buckle plate. So what we have to, to, I mean, to remember, or to get to remember what we learned in the school, how teeth erupt. Teeth erupt essentially from inside outside. And when they erupt from inside outside and up or down from the upper, then, this is when the buccal plates are essentially uh, developed. Okay. So the, mostly, the buccal plate is mostly alveolar process. It's not really a basal bone. On the lingual side, we have support more of a basal bone. And, and only the, the volume of the width, essentially, is essentially alveolar bone. And this is why it's a functional bone. When you now extract the tooth, the functional bone disappears. It's not strained by, by, by the periodontal ligament anymore. And this is why we lose the buccal plate. Mm. Okay. And this is really our main job, how we can preserve it. And then if not, how we can restore it. So th thank you for that, because uh, I wish I'd asked you this 20 years ago, because uh, I thought I, I, I saw this, and we all see that the buccal plate is the one resorbing. Now we have uh, a great explanation. So thank you. Thank you for that. So is there a chance to be able to preserve the original bone volume as it was when a tooth was there. Is there even a remote chance that that can actually happen? Well, this is the challenge of our profession all the time. Okay, we're fighting it also in periodontal bone loss. 
In the last 20 years uh, in my lab, working together also with another professor, maybe you know, Abinoam Jaffe, okay, from yes. Jerusalem. Yes, he's also a perio in, in prostodontics. And we found essentially something which is neglected by dentists. And this is the attachment of marginal gingiva to the root. Now we found that once this attachment, we lose this attachment, then cells which are in the marginal gingiva, cells, they send a, a signal to alveolar bone loss. I mean to alveolar bone resorption, okay? Now, if we want to restore, for example, even a periodontal defect, okay, I believe that if we can reconnect back by biological connection, of the of the cells and the and the attachment of the marginal gingiva to the root or to even to the implant, we can maintain the bone underneath. Are you even, are you referring to so the junctional we, epithelium? Oh, sorry? sorry, are you referring to the junctional epithelium that is basically destroyed when we extract the tooth? I'm I'm referring to the essentially to the free gingiva, to the papilla, okay? I, I can tell you a, a very short uh, study that was done by uh, a dentist in uh, Germany, Gomez Roman, and I will do it very fast. And what he extracted, uh, he, he did implants, and uh, single implants in the, in, the, in the anterior part of the maxilla. And when he, he, he did two kinds of surgeries, and this is something which clinicians say, should, should I mean, uh, hear this, this study. Uh, he did, once he had to do one single implant in the front part. So what he did, he did two kinds of surgeries. He cut under the papilla a flap and did the implant, or he cut through the papilla disconnecting the papilla, not only the papilla, also the marginal gingiva, okay, to the root surface, the sharper fibers to the root surface. And he measured the resorption after time. He found that he, he had a lot of resorption when he essentially cut the, the, the connection of the papilla to the root, okay, and the marginal gingiva. Once he did the surgery under the papilla and left them, yes, then at this point, he had a very low resorption rate. He couldn't explain, but uh, our studies did explain it because when, when we cut the dental gingival fibers, we always lose bone. Sometimes it's reversible and usually it's not. And, and, and that's so interesting. And what, what are the, Dr. Binderman, what are the, implic the clinical implications of a study like that? So how can we now apply it clinically if there is something first like all, that? First of all, this every clinician that does surgery has to understand that the papilla and the marginal gingiva connection to the root are essentially the most important protection of the bone underneath, not the periodontal ligament, okay? This is how it starts the periodontitis, essentially. Okay, now, if we now want to build, for example, bone, okay? If we are able, if we will be able, and I'm sure in the future we will be able, yes, to attach the marginal gingiva after grafting, okay, or even after extraction, to attach the marginal gingiva biologically to a, an implant, yes, then this, this bone buckle plate will survive. Hmm. Okay? Okay, okay, that's because amazing. The buckle uh, plate uh, is right? part of the marginal gingiva, it's the periodontum. Okay, so the papilla 
and the free gingival margin or the marginal gingiva are the most crucial. So clinically, if we can do anything to avoid damage, which we also see clinically, uh, that would obviously give us a better chance. Now, what do we do when we have an infection, uh, because let's say a vertical root fracture, and yeah. the buccal plate is already gone? What mm -hmm. would be the best uh, clinical and scientific approach to address it? Because many times I find that if I don't reflect the flap, I can't clean it out, I can't restore the defect. So what would be, what would be your approach? Yeah, that's of course the <laughs> most important question now, the challenge again of dentistry. Now, so we have, first of all, we have many, of course, grafting materials today. And some are the synthetic are excellent because they, they grow fast bone, okay? Uh, but our problem is not to build new bone, you know? Many years ago, I think Linda have shown you put a membrane and you get underneath a lot of bone. Why we need a graft at all? Was the question. Because he found that after a while this bone disappears. It is resorbed because it's not a functional bone. It's not part of the host. Okay? And you don't have something which is act making it active. So then we started to use together with some bone graft materials, of course. Now, it's a lot, we have a lot of selection of bone graft materials. So as I said, some are excellent synthetic, like calcium sulfate, as an example, it will produce bone, fast bone, and uh, we know it for maybe 50, 60 years. And they used uh, uh, gypsum for, to, to graft. And, and it, but again, it dissolves. Disappear. 